Today, though it might not seem like it at first, we have a story about love. The love of families and friends. The love of life together. And the love of new life found in the glories of Easter. Today is a celebration of love. Loving one another. For God so loved the world. I mean, we are in John's Gospel. Now, it's been argued that it's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. The idea of the lucky, broken-hearted, who, despite finding themselves in the depths, is aware that having love break your heart is beautiful in a way, because at least love was there. Though I would not recommend using those words to anyone who might have recently lost someone in their lives, either through the end of a relationship or because of death. Because when one is sitting in the depths, the notion better to have loved and lost, I find, sounds pandering at best. But regardless, let's begin by considering the disciples. See, Jesus was crucified on Friday and put in the tomb that night. And today is the first day of the week. In the early morning, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and the beloved disciple, as John recounts it, went to the tomb and saw that the stone was rolled away. Peter and the beloved disciple didn't understand what was going on when they saw the folded linen and the empty tomb. So they ran home, not knowing what to make of the situation. Mary, however, still standing there, is met first by two angels and then by Jesus Having seen the resurrected Christ, it's Mary who turns to go and announce the good news to the disciples. Because, to be frank, in a world without texting or tweeting or smartphones or social media, she actually had to go and have conversations. This is where our gospel picks up this morning, on the evening of that first day. The disciples, unless they've spoken to Mary, have no idea about the resurrection. At best, they've heard the misunderstood account of Peter and the beloved and believe that through some act of grave robbing, their beloved Jesus, their friend, mentor, and savior, is gone as far as they know, for what seems to be the second time. And so what do they do now that they've lost someone that they love? Again, it seems. They lock themselves in a room. Scriptures say because they were afraid. They were afraid of the Jews, as St. John writes it. St. John was pointing back to the crowds that yelled, Crucify him, crucify him. That entire gathering of people. This would be kind of like me referring to all the people in Ohio as Cleveland Browns fans. Sure, there are a lot here, but not everyone in Ohio is. In that respect, John is making the point that the disciples were afraid of the masses, the crowds who collectively chose Jesus over Barabbas to be crucified. These are the same crowds that Peter the Rock feared to the point of denying Christ three times. The same crowds in which some yelled both Hosanna on Palm Sunday and crucify him on Good Friday. So the disciples, fearing the crowds, the crowds who had just put Jesus to death, fearing them and mourning the death of Jesus, they went into a room and locked the doors. The disciples, aware of it or not, were afraid of themselves, as anyone on the other side of losing someone can be. Afraid of having to deal with themselves, afraid of the pain, of the loneliness, afraid of the world that they do not know, which is a world without Jesus, who they loved. The disciples were afraid of the what-ifs that rear their head when things don't pan out like we planned. What if I would have done it a little differently? What if I would have worked a little harder? What if I would have done a little more? What if I had been someone different? Would all of this had worked out differently? Afraid of the darkness, afraid of the loneliness, afraid of the fear and the rage and the helplessness, the hole, the void, the nothingness that is left in the wake of what was such a beautiful thing 
they lock themselves in a room. See, we as people like things to line up. We want things to fit in their place from A to B all the way to Z. And for us to read this in the 21st century, we know the story. Jesus dies on Friday and is back on Sunday and boom, we're good. We know what's happening. But that's not how it was in the 20th chapter of John's gospel, the first time it happened, or I should say the time it actually happened. Today is a day about love, not idealism, because in today's reading, we do not find both. As our reading begins, we find fear, we find mourning, we find that the only thing the disciples think they know is that Jesus is dead. The disciples are so afraid that they've locked themselves in a room as much to keep the world outside as to hide their tears and their hurt and their shame and their powerlessness in the face of death. The disciples are not gathered with idealism, but with the helplessness of love. It's the helplessness that comes as babies cry and children go off to college. The helplessness when people leave and die. It's the helplessness that comes when there is nothing that we can do. That feeling of holding someone you love who needs something you cannot provide. And knowing that despite every urge and desire in your being, that there is nothing that you can actually do. It's part of the fear of love. A fear that comes with a special kind of intimacy. A revealing of oneself to another and often to themselves. A letting in of others that exposes holes, holes that are filled by love, the love of partners and families and children and friends, holes that are filled by the love of God. A hole that, though unknown before its reveal, if emptied, is rendered hollow and aching and longing. That's the thing, though. Love is not ideal by our set parameters. It isn't logical or necessarily easy, but being what it is makes love perfect in its own way, beautiful in its own perfection. Love is not obedient, it has its own agenda, and that, that is an agenda of yes, of hope, of fullness, an agenda filled with tomorrows. An agenda that bursts through the walls we build around ourselves, Walls of fear and sadness, walls of protection, elaborate psychological security systems to guard us, walls of what if, that we beat our heads on time and time again, as we are dead set to build walls to keep others out, to shelter ourselves. And still, love comes in. Rarely knocking or using what we would appreciate as social graces, that is, calling or making an appointment or scheduling a convenient time. Instead, love comes tumbling down. Tumbling into the most unexpected of places. Love comes tumbling off of the cross and into our walled-up lives. There's a famous painting of Jesus knocking on a door. There's a lantern lit and some kind of odd vine trellis that Jesus is standing under. If you examine the painting, you'll notice that there is no handle on the door, however. The artist has not given Jesus any way to actually open that door to get in. I always like to think about this painting with today's gospel, with the disciples locked inside, hiding from fear, from hurt, from the what-ifs and the why-didn't-its, thinking that they're safe. And then they turn around and see that Jesus is there in their midst. Hiding from the world and from themselves, imagine the disciples turn around to see, as St. Paul wrote, that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither things present nor past, neither angel nor devil, neither wall, man-made, nor self-made. This is the love that we have been baptized into, a love that will not stop, a love that will surprise us, a love that will tumble down from the heavens, and a love 
that meets us in our locked rooms. Thanks be to God. Amen.